Hello, welcome to the Paris Air Forum. I'm Tim Heifer from Reuters, and I'm joined today by Joseph Varady, the CEO of Wizz Air, one of Europe's uh, fastest growing airlines based in Hungary, uh, airline that uh, Joseph uh, Varady uh, helped to found in 2003, uh, and which has seen an, an astonishing performance since then. Um, he is going to talk to us today about the crisis currently facing the industry and how he sees his airline and the industry recovering from this crisis. Joseph, welcome to the Paris Air Forum. Oh, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you for inviting me. So I guess my first job, I talked a little bit about the history of the airline. Uh, it must seem a long time since those early days. What persuaded you to leave a, a, a very good job in uh, Procter and Gamble and go into the airline industry? Well, that, that, that's a really good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to it, but, uh, you know, when you work for a company like Procter and Gamble, which is um, top notch and a real business school, and I always looked at P&G as, uh, as a business school I, I graduated from in, 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 in real terms. Uh, but it's a huge corporation and no matter what you do, you are just part of the machine and you, you know, you can be a small part or a big part, but you are still just part of a machine. I always saw that when I handed over my business card to, uh, to, to someone, 95% of the job was done. So I might have added 5% or distracted 5%, but that, that was about it. It was a very weird machine. And I felt that I, I want to do more and I want to test myself. I, I have more entrepreneurship, um, uh, in my veins and, you know, I just, I just want to take more risk and to see what I'm capable of uh, achieving. And that's why I changed the industry. Um, maybe in the first case, it didn't really work out that well. I went to Malay Hungarian Airlines and uh, uh, after two years, I, I left uh, the airline. But I learned a lot on the industry and about the industry in those days. And I think that really gave me a lot of inspirations to, um, uh, to kickstart uh, Visa at that time. And at that airline experience combined with, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the experience of capitalism at, uh, at P&G and consumer mindset uh, helped me a lot and equipped me, you know, with the skills and kind of the attitude uh, how to get into the airline uh, industry with a, with a brand new airline called, uh, called Visa, taking advantage of, of the situation uh, as it uh, arose uh, from the EU accession process that was the year in 2004 when 10 countries joined the European Union. And that, that, that was really the momentum that, that triggered this ad, that created the opportunity for the new airline. Well, uh, as you said, um, uh, Malef uh, no longer exists. And uh, you went on to uh, found um, uh, uh, Wizz Air. Uh, I gather things were very difficult. You didn't even know whether you could pay your staff in the early days. What, what did you learn in those early days that is most important for you in uh, keeping going during this crisis? Oh, look, I mean, I, I think uh, under the circumstances, one thing you clearly learn that cash is king. And I think that principle has uh, served us very well and it's, ser it's serving us incredibly well today. Uh, I mean, we are in a position where we are because we have been incredibly focused on preserving cash. You know, I'm an economist and one of the first things what you learn in, 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 in economics is that uh, economies develop through cycles and uh, it's just a matter of time when you go from an up cycle to a down cycle and back into the up cycle. So, you know, we knew in, I knew it in 2008, 2009 that uh, a crisis gives you the opportunity to restate your business and better businesses actually come out of crisis situations uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a better and more formidable uh, competing force. Now, at that time, we simply didn't have the, um, the financial resources to scale the resilience to, full take, uh, to take full advantage of, of, of that opportunity. Uh, but we had been kind of preparing ourselves for the next crisis. And here you go. I mean, obviously, we didn't know that it, whether it would be called COVID-19 or what. Uh, but we had been very prepared deliberately for the next crisis in terms of, you know, our cost performance. I mean, we are in a commodity. We know that in commodity businesses, uh, lowest cost uh, prevails. Uh, and in terms of liquidity and cash, uh, I mean, you know that um, you need cash to step change your presence and take advantage of the situation vis-a-vis -vis your competitors when it's a crisis situation. And we have been deliberately uh, preparing our assess for it. I think that helps us a lot now. 
I mean, of course, we are not immune from uh, coronavirus. I mean, we are uh, deeply affected, uh, but at the same time, uh, we have the resilience to go through this crisis uh, and uh, look at the future on a, on a constant basis. So we have never lost focus on our uh, destiny, on our long-term path here, uh, despite the fact that we are fighting the, uh, the situation coming from uh, coronavirus pretty much on a day-by-day -day basis, but we are very focused on delivering uh, this business on a long-term basis and try to take advantage of, of, of the situation. Well, you, uh, you mentioned um, uh, your, your focus on cash. Uh, of course, you're doing something now that uh, many airlines are not doing, most airlines are not doing. You're taking delivery of more aircraft, you're opening new bases, and you continue to expand. How long can you do that without uh, threatening your cash uh, priorities that you just spoke about? Well, you know, we are a fairly sim uh, simple business. I mean, uh, I think the times we are in today, in, in sort of approaching the middle of the winter season, which is a uh, an off-peak period in, in European travel in any event, even in good times, so this is a very difficult time, but that's um, now topped with the problems uh, arising from uh, COVID-19, um, and uh, that's still the function of the restrictions imposed by governments, a sort of ki killing demand uh, off. Um, it is a cash burn, um, but we applied a, a very simple uh, principle and we continue to apply that, that it should make sense to fly uh, the aircraft as opposed to keep the aircraft on the ground uh, from a cash perspective. So we only fly if we contribute to, uh, to cash. If we don't contribute to cash, we don't fly. Uh, so that financial di discipline, I think, helps us um, uh, remain very focused on, on, on liquidity and make sure that we only burn what, uh, what we can't avoid to burn, but we are not adding to the cash burn. And uh, despite the fact that we have opened a lot of new services, not new bases and new routes uh, over the last period of time, I mean, we are taking this principle very seriously and we are adjusting capacity uh, in accordance with, with market demand. And, and as a result, I mean, you know, we were flying 3% capacity in April, 81% uh, in August, and we are probably around 20% in, uh, in November. So capacity becomes a variable to that, uh, uh, to that, uh, to that strategy. But once the restrictions start to fall away, we will be back in the air very quickly with, uh, with a robust, robust and quick recovery. I mean, we went from 3% to 81% uh, over the course of, of three to four months. Uh, we, can, we can do the same once we see the situation improving. So how do you see now, especially in the light of the news that we've had in the last few days about uh, breakthroughs in vaccines, um, where do you expect your capacity to be, say, next summer? I don't think the problem is with the consumer. I think the problem is with the governments. I mean, consumers' willingness to travel is there. I mean, you know, we, we have clear empirical evidence that uh, those countries which are less closed, uh, more open, less restrictive, uh, we see much significant uh, demand uh, for flying. Obviously not the same magnitude as it was in 2019, but pretty significant compared to those countries uh, which are restricted or locked down. Uh, so the real question here is when governments will start unlocking the countries, when governments will start eliminating measures like quarantines, uh, and, um, and to what extent you know, the availability of vaccination is helping, and at what pace uh, that would uh, uh, dictate to governments to start unlocking countries, I don't know exactly. I would guess that uh, vaccination should help, the, uh, uh, the recovery uh, from a pandemic perspective, we will still face with the economic impact because obviously it is a, a significant impact on GDP production of countries. I mean, if you look at Europe, Europe is going to be down um, somewhere between 10 to 15 percent uh, in 2020 versus last year on, on GDP. I mean, this is not sustainable. Uh, so we shall see how uh, things will come back into a uh, uh, into normal levels, but uh, yeah, I think vaccination has, but it is not a direct influencer to um, uh, to demand. I mean, because the problem is not with the consumer, the problem is with the government. So we need to see government actions to be taken as a result of vaccinations becoming available. So, I mean, what, what do you expect governments to do? Is it a problem of coordination in Europe? Um, uh, you've mentioned the sort of piece, piecemeal approach that we've had to the crisis. Um, what do they have to do to get, get the industry working again? I think governments 
have been incredibly poor. Uh, they have been hugely underperforming. I mean, you know, one of the things, you know, you, you could have expected with some reasonable minds, especially after the breakout of the, of the pandemic, is that there would be some coordination uh, on a global basis, but at least on a European basis. I mean, it is the same virus everywhere irrespective of your nationality, your race, or, or whatever. I mean, uh, they are all exposed pretty much the same way. So as this is a global phenomenon, some global orchestrated, uh, globally orchestrated measures would be, uh, would be imposed and governments would coordinate. We are operating to 46 countries, and there are no two countries uh, that, would, uh, that would have applied the same sets of measures. It is all over the place. Uh, and it, I think, uh, to be honest, it has become pretty much like a zoo uh, it, it's a jungle. Um, I mean, no one understands what's going on in one country versus another country, uh, and things keep changing. Uh, so, under these circumstances, it is impossible to uh, to come out um, uh, with the economy with any degree of effectiveness, and uh, that is a significant, unnecessary price we are paying for the underperformance of governments. Uh, but uh, I mean, clearly, there is no coordination, and because of the lack of coordination. And the over politicized agendas flowing into the um, uh, handling of, of coronavirus, uh, I think it just makes things much worse and unpredictable. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm not overly optimistic that uh, uh, we will see more coordination. I mean, we have failed uh, to coordinate anything over the last eight months. I mean, uh, I, I don't think I'm seeing anything that would suggest uh, anything different going forward. So unfortunately, we have to live together with this. Um, uh, uncoordinated approach with this um, political underperformance uh, and with the significant price tag coming with it. Uh, but that's what it is. But at one point in time, I think the economic reality is we will force governments to, uh, to start using brains and start applying measures that actually make sense. I mentioned the fact that you keep, uh, your, I think, uh, together with uh, Indigo in India, uh, the by far the largest airline still taking um, deliveries from Airbus. Um, are you able to, uh, does that help uh, with the pricing of your aircraft? Do you get bigger discounts because you're basically amongst the very few people still standing on their feet and taking planes at the moment? Uh, I, I don't want to get into you know commercial territories um, because of the confidential nature of agreements with uh, uh, with, our, with our business partners, but the, the fundamental driver uh, of new aircraft deliveries from our standpoint is, uh, is, is the long-term impact of, of flying a younger fleet and, 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 and the renewing uh, fleet. I mean, if you think about this, uh, as said, we are in a commodity business, short of flying is a commodity, lowest cost prevails. Uh, a younger fleet of aircraft uh, delivers much lower unit cost, and by the way, it makes a significantly less impact on the environment. So it is beneficial from two perspectives, on economics as well as uh, on sustainability, uh, versus uh, competitors who will be relying increasingly on an aging fleet because they stop new aircraft deliveries and, uh, and they, they defer the aircraft uh, uh, orders. Now, it is just opening a, a significant competitive advantage uh, for this post-pandemic, post-coronavirus. And this is really the strategy we are pursuing here. Uh, of course, we are taking deliveries of aircraft at the moment. We are unable to fly. I mean, we don't fly 100% of the uh, of the fleet as set. Right now, we only fly 20% capacity, but I, I would hope that fairly uh, soon, certainly going into summer next year, that number is going to change dramatically. Uh, but once life gets normalized and industry is sort of coming back to normal, we will have a significant advantage versus our competitors because of the new aircraft deliveries and the economic efficiency and the environmental efficiency flowing through it. Uh, Michael O'Leary of Ryanair, of course, says that uh, he said uh, recently that your reliance on the sale and leaseback model would mean that there would be a widening gap in Ryanair's favor between your respective uh, aircraft uh, unit costs. Um, is that something you're worried about? I mean, he might be factually mistaken, to be honest, because, uh, you know, through our sale and leaseback model, uh, we have been getting access to, um, uh, to capital at lower cost than uh, what he has been getting access to. So I don't think this is necessarily true. Um, I think you would need to look into the, uh, the very economics of each of these financing deals. We are uh, very satisfied with the, um, um, uh, with the financing 
um, deals we have been able to strike and the capital we have been able to access. I mean, let's not forget that Bizar is one of the four airlines in the world with investment grade credit, and we have just um, got reconfirmed and reaffirmed by credit uh, rating agencies on our investment grade. Uh, so uh, obviously that gives us access to, uh, to very low cost capital and we are quite differentiated uh, from the rest of the industry uh, with that regard. So I don't think that there is any widening of, uh, of, uh, of gaps here. I think I would rather say it's the other way around because we are gaining a significant advantage of, uh, of gauging from AC20s to AC21s. I mean, already today, the seats uh, we have um, uh, uh, in our fleet, 50% of it is flown on AC321, you know, should the whole fleet fly. Uh, and our average fleet count at the moment is around 203 seats per aircraft. I mean, this is the highest seat count of any airline in, um, in Europe. And as a result, it, it helps us achieve a significantly lower cost production than, uh, than, than any other airlines. And it keeps growing in a way by further converting our AC20s to AC21. So, um, we, we are seeing uh, different movements and different directions in terms of uh, closing a gap or building a gap, depending on the perspective you are taking. But we, we feel very good about our strategic outcomes uh, coming from the, uh, the fleet composition of this uh, relative to the industry, relative to any other airlines. So let's talk about the, the route out of this crisis and your role. That you've made no secret of the fact that you think that the crisis is an opportunity uh, for Wizz Air. Um, so uh, where do you see the biggest opportunity to pick up uh, routes and slots and traffic? I mean, to be honest, I mean, we, we are seeing uh, many more opportunities than what we can, what we can pursue. We, we have become very selective. Uh, I mean, we, we are in discussions uh, with a big number of, of markets. I mean, clearly, uh, many of the airports uh, are pretty much begging for uh, capacity we can bring to them, uh, especially uh, by seeing their kind of home, home carriers failing or, or significantly reducing, or seeing their inability to um, uh, to recover from a financial standpoint uh, going forward. So I think we are in a fairly privileged position in terms of the number of opportunities uh, presenting uh, um, uh, themselves, uh, and we are very focused on on get the right things uh, for uh, for this and get the right things for the markets uh, done uh, with, uh, with that regard. We have been seeing opportunities uh, pretty much across our uh, operating geography. We are much focused on Central and Eastern Europe and we will stay focused on Central and Eastern Europe. We're seeing that the niche market of, of this air is, uh, is Central and Eastern Europe. But we have been uh, looking west, we have been looking east and we have been going west and going east uh, already prior to, uh, uh, to, to coronavirus and certainly be, uh, be diversified uh, further uh, during the, uh, the COVID, uh, COVID period by opening new countries, new bases in, in Western Europe. But also we have opened quite a number of bases in, uh, in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, um, St. Petersburg, Russia is just, uh, just about to take off. Visa Abu Dhabi uh, has just been licensed and uh, ready to go for, uh, uh, for getting airborne should the country get unlocked. And I think this can happen anytime, anytime soon. Uh, so we have been quite balanced in a way we, we have diversified our, uh, our network. So it is really across the board and I don't really pick one or two, two markets because uh, uh, we have been investing new capacity into probably 10 new countries uh, just in the last uh, few months and we, we continue to, uh, to have the dialogue with, with other countries, with other airports, so probably more to come in the, uh, in the coming period. Um, of course, one airline that comes to mind at the moment that is having very uh, well-publicized difficulties is Norwegian. Do you think that uh, uh, Norwegian slots at Gatwick will become available? And um, how are you positioned to take advantage of that? Uh, I mean, if, if you think about this, um, this whole slot situation in the context of COVID-19 is, 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 is absolutely crazy. I would, I would almost say that um, uh, kind of waiving uh, the slot uh, regulations um, is, 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 is defrauding uh, countries, defrauding uh, customers, defrauding taxpayers. Um, it, you know, airports should be uh, there for serving the public interest and not for some private interest uh, of airlines, incumbent carriers holding slots uh, without operating them or even without having an intention to operate them. 
Uh, and uh, I don't think that what we are having at the moment is sustainable. And, you know, we are certainly totally against any further extension of the uh, of the slot waiver, I think we have to uh, to resume the slot rules, and uh, airlines will have to decide to, uh, uh, to to comply with the slot rules, i.e., operating the slots or losing the slots. Um, and yes, of course, we have a lot of interest into um, uh, entering in entering into new markets, and uh, we are looking at opportunities. I mean, you mentioned London Gatwick. I mean, it, it, it is one of the uh, uh, the the airports we are uh, we are we are talking to, but I have no idea what's going to happen to these slots. Uh, but first, I would like to see the uh, the regulator to take a position on that, and I think it would be very important to uh, to eliminate the slot waiver and 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 to re to resume the uh, the normal slot rules, uh, because you know we can keep referring to COVID-19 forever. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there are airlines who are capable and able to recover. Uh, quickly and can do something for the markets and the consumers and and you know in the interest of the public, and there will be allies who will be dragging uh, for a long time or may never come out of this, uh, and they might be in possession of uh, of access to uh, to airports. But I think it's totally unfair, um, and uh, it is almost like criminal, uh, you know, to uh, to hold those slots without without um, even in intentions to uh, to operate while the public would be in need of an infrastructure. Um, you know, a lot of employees are fired from airports because uh, they, they became unoperational. And if there is a willing airline who wants to invest and who wants to come to the, uh, to the market and who wants to create jobs at the airports, I think those airlines uh, have to be allowed to, uh, to get in. Uh, and, uh, and the regulators must stop defending incumbent interest, which makes no, no sense any longer. Uh, you, you said criminal, that's a strong word. Uh, it sounds as though uh, you might uh, want to try to challenge this in the courts. Is that possible? Oh, I think we're going to challenge it at every level we can. I mean, we're going we're gonna to challenge it at the governmental level, at regulatory level, and uh, if needed, at legal levels as well. How, let's say you get access to more slots. How important a base could Gatwick become? And uh, what do you expect to happen uh, when Wizz Air came into uh, competition with EasyJet there? You know, I, I, think, I think competition is good. Uh, competition is certainly good for the consumer. Um, it creates choices uh, to people, so that improves the market. But I also think competition is good to, uh, to the competitors, to the airlines, because simply, I mean, you become a better business by being contested and, you know, you don't go on the path of complacency. Uh, so, yeah, we are very happy to compete. We are ha very happy to be competed as a matter of principle. I mean, to be honest, uh, our exposure to competition uh, over the last 17 years uh, has simply uh, made us a much better business, a much better airline today. Uh, so you develop your business through competition. If you can't stand competition, you have a problem. Uh, and, uh, and it is just a, um, uh, an illusion to believe that playing Monopoly or, or playing the kind of defended uh, territory is going to help you uh, for the long run, and, and that business model uh, will be sustainable. You might be able to gain some time, but I, it, it won't make you sustainable for, uh, for sure. As a matter of fact, I think it, it takes you to the other direction that uh, simply because of the lack of competition, you don't feel the need, you don't feel the, uh, the heat uh, to, to keep adjusting and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and demanding your model to, to stay relevant in the market for the, uh, the long run. Um, so yeah, I think we, uh, we welcome competition, and you know we want to challenge others, and uh, and I hope that they would they, they would also welcome competition, and you know uh, we would be uh, putting our offerings to the uh, to the consumer, and the consumer will decide. Uh, I think where we come in um, very strongly from a competitive standpoint is, as said, this is a commodity business, and uh, we can sustain low fares on a on a long term basis. Uh, I mean everyone can cut the fares, and everyone can run very low. Uh, promotional prices, but the question is how sustainable they are. And sustainability comes uh, on the premise of post-performance, and for so long as you are, and we are, the, uh, the lowest cost producer, you know, we think we are very well positioned strategically uh, to win that competition in a commodity market like short haul travel. Do you think there is the risk of a price war, or is that even a risk? Is there going to be a price war, especially between airlines like Wizz Air and Ryanair, uh, to get this market moving again and win market share after the crisis. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, no doubt. I mean, at the moment, you know, it is um, 
low demand, low capacity, but once the market opens up, there will be more capacity than demand. So I think there will be a period when uh, the market will have to be re-stimulated uh, and every airline uh, wants to get uh, travelers back into their franchise uh, in, a, in, you know, in an environment with, with overcapacity. So yes, I mean, uh, back to basic economics again, I mean, Pricing is the function of supply and demand. If the market is oversupplied, then prices will fall. If the market is undersupplied, prices will rise. Uh, but I think the market is going to be oversupplied uh, because everyone wants to make you know, uh, their uh, footnote uh, in the market so they will push uh, capacity. And then the real question is, you know, who's got the financial resilience to uh, not only to come out of um, COVID-19 and sort of deal with the burden uh, of that, but um, uh, but being able to finance the uh, uh, the, the, the re uh, franchisement, the uh, the recapture of of customers uh, in a highly competitive environment. So I think, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a lot of competition. It's going to be uh, price wars. Uh, it's going to be low fares uh, in in the initial period for sure. What do you say this brings us now, perhaps onto uh, some of the other issues, environmental and so forth, but. What do you say to people, your legacy carrier competitors, and also uh, environmentalist, uh, environmental campaigners, who say that the very low prices that we see in the low-cost sector are not economically rational, but they're artificially stimulating uh, over-tourism and, 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 and trends like that? I mean, if you, wanna, you want me to give you a short answer, I think it's a complete rubbish, uh, this argument. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, um, um, legacy carriers are economically uh, unsustainable and they are environmentally harmful. I mean, just, just think about this. Uh, the first airlines running for government bailout taxpayers' money uh, are the, the legacy carriers. I mean, they couldn't stand this crisis for two weeks. Uh, that's how bad they are, uh, how poorly they are managed from a financial resilience perspective. If you look at the fleetage, uh, of the airlines. I mean, the, the legacy carriers tend to operate the oldest fleet, polluting the environment the most. I mean, you, you, look and, you, you can look at statistics on, uh, on carbon uh, emission. I mean, uh, legacy carriers uh, significantly, significantly uh, uh, um, poorer in terms of economic, uh, ecological performance than, uh, than low-cost carriers. I mean, our uh, carbon footprint is about half of many of the, the legacy carriers when it comes to, uh, to per passenger uh, emission. Mm. Uh, so the problem is on the other side. I mean, the, the real issue here, I think, is with the, uh, with the legacy carriers. Uh, those businesses must be overhauled, um, maybe um, eliminated, maybe completely uh, restructured. Uh, and uh, I think everyone should be flying low-cost carriers because low-cost carriers are far more efficient from an economic standpoint as well as from an ecological standpoint. And, you know, saying that... Uh, uh, the, the low-cost carrier model is unsa unsustainable. I mean, I mean that's a sheer lie. I mean, low-cost carriers are far more profitable. Uh, they represent a uh, much bigger shareholder value. They bring low fares to the other uh, people, so people don't get ripped off like by the, uh, the legacy carriers. I mean, uh, I think the logic goes ex uh, exactly the opposite direction, um, uh, both from an economic standpoint uh, and from an ecological standpoint. I think the legacy uh, sector uh, is uh, clearly underperforming the uh, local sector. Uh, so they, they have to be overhauled uh, dramatically. Uh, you, you have the lowest emissions in, in what sense? Per passenger, you mean? Oh, per passenger, yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess that's what you, you, you want to know as a passenger if you are uh, traveling, what uh, impact you make on the environment yourself. And uh, we significantly have lower uh, um, uh, carbon footprint than, um, than legacy carriers. But that, I mean, Statistics like that, of course, everyone has different views on these statistics, but there are some people who say, well, that, that only works because you have dense cabins and so many passengers in your cabins, so naturally your emissions per passenger would be lower, but you are flying a, a lot of aircraft because you're stimulating, overstimulating in perhaps their eyes uh, traffic across Europe. But I mean, what is this word overstimulating? I mean, that's, I, I, I don't know what you, what you really mean uh, by, by overstimulating. So when you are making the phone calls uh, or two phone calls, you're saying that you are overstimulating the, uh, 
the, the Mumbai market, I mean, you know, this is a market. Um, this is supply and demand. And uh, either, you know, people buy you or they don't buy you, but there is no such thing as overstimulation. Um, legacy carriers are less, pro less profitable, but actually they are not profitable. Uh, they have no financial resilience. Uh, they are aiding and failing on a continuous basis. They are just bailed out uh, politically uh, time after time. I mean, you look at the history of uh, the Europe's aviation, global aviation, how many times legacy carriers get bailed out. Uh, I don't think there is an argument here. And I don't think there is an argument that uh, flying a 20-year-old airplane is better than flying a two-year-old airplane. Uh, and, you know, this is what we are flying. We are flying a young fleet of aircraft. Those guys are flying a much older fleet of aircraft. Uh, I mean, if you want to say me that uh, uh, driving an old car is uh, ecologically more efficient than driving a new car, I think you have a hard time to sell. What about the flight shaming movement? You've just moved into Norway and in Scandinavia. It's very strong. Um, is this going to be a problem for short haul medium haul travel in Europe, in your view? I think, I think flying shaming is, is going to be uh, a, a matter when it comes to real alternatives to, uh, to flying. I guess short haul domestic flying, I mean, really short haul, like, uh, you know, um, I don't know, a few hundred kilometers, maybe up to 600 kilometers, uh, when you have alternatives to it, like, like a, a, a speed train, like, uh, driving then then I think you can uh, you can look at that um, as, as, as an issue um, mobility remains uh, one of the uh, the basic human uh, needs and I don't think this is going to uh, to change I think people want to be mobile they want to have access to the world and uh, you know they, they want to go they want to fulfill themselves uh, so I don't think this is going to change but I think certain segments of flying, and again, this is typically um, a legacy carriers. I mean, legacy carriers are the ones uh, flying uh, a few hundred kilometers for feeding their home and spoke system. Uh, so I think they will be much more exposed than low-cost carriers uh, who are point-to-point -point, um, 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 services. And, you know, as far as Visa is concerned, the, the average stations of our business is 1,500, 1,600 kilometers. I, I, I don't think you did have another alternative for... Uh, uh, for mobility than, uh, than flying. Uh, what about proximity? I mean, this is one of the things coming out of the COVID crisis. I mean, you and I are talking, we're not wearing masks because we're in a room by ourselves, but uh, obviously we would be if uh, we were in the, in the same space. Um, but a lot of people are very concerned about, uh, about very wary about confinement. Uh, that seems to be at odds with the business model, especially of ultra low cost airlines, perhaps of sort of uh, the most efficient, perhaps more commoditized type of travel, uh, where you're basically squeezed in as tightly as possible. Is, it, are you going to have to communicate in some way that it is okay to get on a plane and it, it's okay to be sitting very close to the next person in front of you and uh, behind you? I, I just hope that, you know, there is some scientific evidence um, flowing into discussions like this, uh, because the fact of the matter is that, um, and it is scientifically um, uh, verified, that um, when you are on an airplane, um, I mean, you, you are in a very protected environment when it comes to, um, uh, to infection. Um, the, the whole design engineering on aircraft is done as such that... Uh, it protects you uh, because of the airflows and the HEPA filters and, and all those sort of things, uh, much more than you are in a different uh, environment. Uh, and uh, also, I don't think we have a lot of evidence uh, that would suggest that uh, flying is an infectious activity. I mean, you know, millions of people have been flying since the breakout of COVID-19. Uh, and I don't think the industry has been scoring cross-infection um, uh, as a result of, um, of, of, of flying. And uh, I, I don't think this is the major concern here. Um, I mean, obviously, you need to deal with the situation as it happens today. But, uh, you know, during the time of aviation, during the time of, uh, of flying, uh, we have been seeing uh, various viruses and we will be seeing viruses going forward. I don't think COVID-19 is the last one and probably going to be increasingly exposed to, uh, to issues like this in the, uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, I don't think that this is a fundamental matter here which would suggest that uh, 
uh, if, if you are uh, 35 centimeters away from each other, it's bad. But if you are 36 centimeters, that's good, uh, because that's probably the difference what legacy carriers can, uh, uh, can deliver. Uh, so I, I don't think I would be uh, worried too much about it. Uh, and uh, again, if I look at consumer issues today, the consumer is not overly worried about the health concern of flying. I think actually people are fairly relaxed about flying. I, don't, I think the industry has done a good job uh, to prove itself uh, being COVID resilient from a pandemic perspective. Uh, and Viser, as a matter of fact, was the very first airline in Europe launching a new health and safety protocol when we enhance our standards. And we were the very first airline signing over the EASA regulatory standards coming to, uh, uh, to health and safety um, in, this, uh, in this COVID times. Uh, but the issue here is really the, um, uh, the restrictions imposed by governments uh, essentially um, uh, under, undermining demand in a, in, in a big way and making travel pretty much impossible to consumers. What about um, uh, business travel and more sort of crossover markets? What, uh, what sort of percentage of your traffic is business travel at the moment or, or anything, you know, non-tourism related travel? Yeah, I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, we have a uh, fairly margin exposure to business travel. I would say 5 to 10 percent of our total uh, customer base um, travel on, on, on business purposes. Uh, we would have around uh, a good half uh, of our customer base um, traveling uh, for VFR uh, purposes and the rest kind of 30, 40 percent would be uh, um, the leisure traveler, sure. uh, if you wish. Uh, so we have a very diversified uh, portfolio of, of customers. I think business travel is tough. Uh, it's going to take time to, uh, to recover. I think this is one of the most exposed uh, uh, travel uh, group um, next to elderly travel, because obviously elderly people are more exposed to, uh, to, the, pandemic, to the pandemic itself. But you know, um, our traffic flows are, are much more towards um, VFR, visiting friends and relatives, uh, work and study-related study uh, travel uh, and, um, and, and, and the leisure travelers. And if you look at the, um, the age of customers, Visa flies the youngest uh, customer uh, in the whole of Europe. And, and certainly what we should expect is that uh, the youngsters will come back to the franchise of flying uh, much earlier than the elderly, elderly people. So I think with that regard, we are actually quite well positioned to win um, when it comes to the recovery phase of, uh, of the pandemic. I, I wondered if you might see more business travel um, as a result of the crisis, people sort of scaling back their spending. And if so, whether, that, whether there is anything that might tempt you away from the ultra low cost model that you've defended with such discipline and uh, produce oh. a slightly more hybrid product. Oh, no, I think it should become even more ultra-low-cost. Um, um, I don't think it should be migrating to the middle. I, this is kind of a death territory from a business model perspective. And, uh, uh, you know, you try to move up on cost uh, to try to capture some higher revenue streams. Uh, and then you are exposed to lower-cost competitors and you are not right at the standards of the, uh, of the, of the legacy guys who, who may deliver a better product. I mean, we have seen a number of airlines kind of failing with the strategy I mean, certainly Vizet is not going to be one of them, and I don't think we should be moving uh, anywhere um, towards higher cost propositions. As a matter of fact, we should become even lower cost. So using that model, we've talked about your uh, very rapid expansion. Um, one of the most important projects that you have in hand at the moment is a new carrier in uh, Abu Dhabi uh, with a local uh, government partner. Um, that's been delayed a few times, perhaps for obvious reasons, but when, when, what would it take to get that venture off the ground? Oh, I mean, simply we just need to see the restrictions um, falling away. I mean, once the restrictions are moving and the country is getting unlocked, we're going to be in the air. Why do you think you will be successful in that market? It's a very different uh, uh, market, arguably, from the one that you're in now. Uh, it's also quite crowded with uh, Fly Dubai, Air Arabia. Um, uh, and so you're going to have your work cut out to, to, to establish yourselves there, would you say? Yeah, of course, as I said at the beginning, you know, we, we, we are very happy to compete. I think we bring in a proposition to the market which is uniquely differentiating us. 
uh, we, we will be the lowest cost producer again in a commodity market. Um, I think Abu Dhabi increasingly wants to be a diversified economy. They want to diversify away from the carbon economy and we can create a lot of value uh, to their strategy by uh, enabling people to access the, um, uh, the market. And, and we want I think we've lost the connection with Joseph Varadi, but we're going to try to get it back. Sorry, Tim, we got caught by technology. <laughs> no problem. Um, I can't see you. Can you... One moment. I see you. Oh, okay. I'm waiting for a signal. Okay. We lost each other there. Um, perhaps one of the perils of, uh, of uh, online technology, but we're back. Um, you were saying uh, Abu Dhabi, you see yeah, yeah. that as a promising market. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are, we are very, um, very confident in Abu Dhabi uh, because we can feed well into the strategy of the country uh, to get more diversified away from carbons through tourism. Uh, and I think that's where the low cost airline model plays in uh, very, very well. Uh, we are going to be the lowest cost producer in, uh, in Abu Dhabi and uh, you can't have a better strategy than, uh, than that. Uh, and uh, also if you look at the, uh, the possible market reach uh, from Abu Dhabi, I mean, that's very significant. I mean, we would be possibly accessing billions of people in the, uh, in the world. And uh, as we have used um, our European platform, Visa Hungary, as a platform for uh, a larger expansion, not only for Hungary, but entering a, a number of countries uh, with base operations, uh, possibly over time, once uh, you know some markets get more uh, liberalized from a regulatory perspective, I think Visa Abu Dhabi can be used as an operating platform in, 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 more, in more geographies than just, uh, than just Abu Dhabi. And where would that be specifically? Into India, say, elsewhere? Oh, I mean, I, I would say that probably as a first phase of liberalization, you will see more ties uh, being developed in the, in the GCC uh, itself. And then we shall see how the world is going to get uh, more aligned and more, uh, more liberalized and more accessible from a regulatory perspective. I mean, the world is changing. I mean, I mean clearly, you know, you have seen uh, quite significant movements over the last few years. I mean, up to five years ago, um, Israel used to be a completely closed market. Uh, today, uh, we are the largest international airline in, uh, in, in Israel. Uh, as I said, we are just about to open up a base in St. Petersburg, Russia, Russia which was unheard of uh, before entering the, um, uh, the market as a, as a foreign carrier and operating a, a base in, uh, in, in Russia. So I think the regulatory framework keeps moving and keeps evolving, uh, from my perspective, um, the right direction. And it is very, very important that, you know, we, we stand ready to take advantage of that and we, we keep uh, planting the flex of, uh, of, of low-cost flying uh, by entering into new geographies and building ourselves up in those, in those new, new markets. 
as the limit uh, as the limitations of the regulatory framework is uh, is easing. Where where do you see your expansion after this? Uh, mainly, w would it focus on Western Europe now, or do you see further opportunities uh, eastwards? No, I think I think our, our main focus won't change. Our main focus will remain on Central Eastern Europe. Uh, but uh, you know, we go east, we go west, depending on the opportunities. I think Western opportunities are more uh, going to arise from market consolidation. Uh, Eastern opportunities will arise more from regulatory openings. And uh, you know, we keep an eye on on both directions. But the main focus will remain on Central and Eastern Europe, which is an underpenetrated market. I mean, you you know, with economic performance and uh, and and convergence. Uh, Central East Europe will continue to, uh, to build itself up for airline penetration. At the moment, only uh, a fourth uh, of Western European um, travelers are uh, in Central East Europe from a penetration perspective. Uh, that will continue to improve, but this is the function of GDP, uh, economic convergence, and, uh, and you know, we can be uh, a driving force on, of, of that, but also a beneficiary of that economic uh, development. So yeah, Central East Europe uh, comes first, then going west, going east, depending on the opportunities as a second layer of opportunities. Has been suggested by your competitor that in Western Europe, in particular, that you, your possibilities for expansion are limited by your the very strong stance that you've taken on uh, labour unions. Uh, you've just opened in Norway, and there are calls for a boycott of Wizz Air there already. Uh, because you you don't recognize unions. Is that an absolute red line for you, or is that something that you think that you you could uh, um, uh, compromise on at some point in, as you grow in Western Europe? Uh, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, boycotting bizarre in Norway is illegal. Uh, it is against uh, European regulations. It is against Norwegian regulations, and we are challenging it from a legal standpoint. Uh, I also think that you know some of the reactions in Norway are uh, made um, uh, mistakenly because simply people don't understand uh, Bizer. They don't understand our stance on on various matters. Uh, we recognize every right of individuals and groups of people. Uh, these are constitutional rights, by the way. Uh, so who are we to uh, to override that? Uh, that's not the point. What we are making. The point what we are making is that we think that we have an alternative which works better and we have a better company culture than uh, what otherwise could be, uh, could be, could be achieved. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we deny any rights of any people. I think that's a false statement uh, uh, for whatever purposes. I mean, we, we are perfectly fine with every constitutional rights of individuals, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you can't have something better than, and then, and by the way, if you want to be totally factual, 50% um, of the Norwegian workforce is non-unionized. Uh, so that's not true that, you know, if you want to do business in a country, you, uh, you have to be unionized. Uh, you know, some people like using double measures and, uh, and double standards. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we do what we think is right for our business. Uh, and we, we think, uh, you know, it's right for our people, for our employees, for our stakeholders. And so far, the culture, what we have developed that with, has been serving the interests of every single stakeholder as very well, including the employees. Because my question is not really about double standards, but about your opportunities for growth and your cost structure. Uh, your competitor, Michael O'Leary himself, was one of the greatest uh, apostles of, uh, of, of non-union uh, airlines in the industry has now had to um, uh, bend on this. Uh, it, it, in the end, uh, it, it, it's just good business to, to work with this system in Western Europe, uh, some people seem to feel. Uh, is there anything that would make you uh, reconsider this, or is this just a, a sort of uh, a position that you, you, you intend to stick to? Uh, look, I mean, I think we have, a, we have a business model. That business model has uh, made us successful, and uh, we have no reason to step away from that business model. And I think we are very keen on uh, delivering the USCC, the auto locals business model going forward. We should not be um, stepping away from that, and, uh, and that will remain in focus for management. If uh, we have to take uh, unmanageable compromises on the business model, simply we are not going to enter that market. Uh, we think that the integrity of the model is critical for the long-term success of, mm -hmm. uh, of BZ. 
and uh, and our ability to continue to create shareholder value. Uh, and this is the line we are taking. And if we have to cross the line, we are not going to cross it. Well, that's that's very clear. Thank you. So. Looking forward, coming out, you obviously see yourself as one of the winners. Um, how do you see the structure of the market as, as a whole in Europe? How many, is there room for three uh, large, low-cost carriers in Europe in the post-COVID market? I think you will, you will kind of see... Uh, three categories of airlines um, uh, from here. Um, I mean, you will see those who will self-sufficiently su uh, survive and actually come out as uh, as uh, as winners of the of the situation. Uh, we are one of them. Um, these airlines will not be subject to bailouts. Uh, they will sort themselves out. They have access to the capital capital market. If they need to take uh, additional liquidity, but quite likely they will do well. They will do very well uh, with their own liquidity already preserved in the uh, in the system. You don't have too many airlines uh, like that. Probably two um, uh, in Europe, and I think we are we are one of them. Then you have the other category called survivors. I mean, these airlines will survive mainly based on uh, government bailouts. But these businesses will be curtailed going forward because uh, uh, a lot of taxpayers' money will be uh, put into these uh, these businesses, and I think taxpayers will make uh, airline managements and governments responsible for uh, spending that money and making them accountable for uh, the, the results coming out of that uh, that investment. And so far, what I'm seeing is that that money is just completely wasted. I mean, you are not seeing any airlines. Uh, being restructured as a result of COVID-19. It's just uh, financing inefficiencies and, uh, and complacency. So I think these allies will, will go through and will survive, but I don't think they will be able to prosper for, uh, for some time as a result of that curtailment. And allies in between will be totally down to the market if they find investors uh, who would be willing to put money into them. Yeah, maybe they go through, but most likely uh, most of these airlines will fail and will uh, will, uh, will 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 not make it, or will will fail financially and go bankrupt during the uh, the recovery phase, uh, which I would not underestimate from a financial challenge perspective. The recovery will drag a lot of financial resources, a lot of cash, uh, and not many airlines will uh, will have that available uh, to uh, to invest. So uh, yeah, I think you will see a smaller industry uh, in terms of number of players. You will see the better players to recover much quicker than the uh, uh, than the, the dragging survivors, uh, and uh, and it, the industry will be reshaped. I think you're going to see a significant shift uh, in favor of low cost carriers. So low cost carriers will take a significant market share gain uh, post COVID-19. Do you see any uh, any scope for consolidation even amongst low cost carriers? I'm wondering, for example, if there's any scenario in which you could uh, imagine um, teaming up with EasyJet to take on Ryanair? I think these are interesting intellectual um, exercises. Uh, the reality is that uh, every, every merger, every M&A kind of activity is, uh, is a possible compromise on the, um, on the business model. And... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it could be transformational, but I think we would need to, uh, to see uh, that opportunity. Uh, you need willing parties to, uh, to consider an option like that. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we are much focused on building this on an organic basis. This is what we have done uh, over 17 years. And to be honest, as we speak, you know, we don't really see uh, why we should not continue to that. I mean, we have so many opportunities uh, for organic growth that uh, we rather juggle with the issues of not being able to... Uh, to take uh, all those opportunities, and I think we, we, we just stay focused on this line. Well, you have a very successful recipe. You've been very clear today. You're sticking to it. Uh, absolutely no compromise on the uh, business model that you have. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your views on this exceptional crisis and uh, the possible path out of it for the low-cost sector. And uh, we look forward to welcome you, hopefully, in person next year. Joseph, thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.